Good morning, everybody, and welcome to another Patient Safety Movement Foundation webinar. I'm Donna Prosser. I'm the Chief Clinical Officer here at the Patient Safety Movement Foundation. And today we're going to be talking about care coordination, uh, most specifically focusing on those coordination activities that need to happen during transitions of care. So um, we have a lot to talk about today, as you can see by our objectives. We're going to talk about those typical gaps that are experienced during transitions, talk about potential solutions to improve that, um, identify strategies where we can engage patients and families so they can participate in coordination activities, and evaluate the, the impact that social disparities have on this, as well as looking at outcomes that, can, um, that, uh, that we can evaluate to see how you guys are doing. So um, we, as always, are gonna be providing continuing education credit for this webinar. For nurses, pharmacists, and physicians, this continuing education credit will be coming from MedStar Health. So if you have registered as one of these professions and indicated that you are looking for CE, then you should receive a webinar, uh, I'm sorry, a, an email from MedStar within the next five to seven days with in instructions on how you can complete an evaluation and get that information. If you are a respiratory therapist, um, depending on your state, you may be able to claim nursing credit um, that you can apply as well. This is an example of what the email will look like from MedStar so that you know what to anticipate. We will also be providing CE for um, healthcare executives through ACHE. So you can just log that into your ACHE account. For CPPS and for uh, board certified patient advocates, you'll receive a certificate from the Patient Safety Movement Foundation if you indicated that you are seeking that credit. And if you are a certified professional in healthcare quality looking for credit, then again, your attendance will be documented by NAHQ for that. So as you can see here, none of our speakers or any members of the planning committee have any financial disclosures to report. And so with that, I am so excited to get going and introduce our panelists today. So, um, so very quickly, I'm gonna just run through who our panelists are and then um, we are, I'm gonna let each of the panelists uh, introduce themselves. But today we have Donna Gadsden, she is a mother and a caregiver with a, to her son with chronic illness in the UK. Mark Williams is a, a professor and director for the Center for Health Services Research at the University of Kentucky and the Chief Quality Officer at, at UK Healthcare. Nisha Nair is a consultant and patient safety expert um, at, and a, a, the Senior Manager of Medical Affairs and Quality at Aster DM Healthcare in the UAE. And Marty Moore, a patient safety consultant at Simpler, um, and who was previously the, the corporate chief nursing officer at Medline Industries. So welcome to all of our panelists. I'm so excited to have you all here today. Um, and so I'd like to just get started with Donner. Donner, I wonder if you could tell us just a little bit about your background and tell us about the gaps that you've seen in your experience in care coordination with your son. Um, yes, um, my name is Donna, obviously. I um, have a 32-year-old son who I've been a carer for, for uh, about 12 years. And um, it's, it's been a challenge, <laughs> but I've, um, we're, we're getting there. It's things. So I'm sorry, would you like me to go through my first... Oh, no, no, just, just tell us very briefly, you know, um, you know yeah. what, what are some of the things that you've experienced with your son and care coordination in the past? Um, mainly because of his long-term chronic care. That's when we find that sometimes it's difficult with different people coming on board, different teams that, that don't know. And that's where a lot of, you know, you have to start from the beginning. And that's when um, we do notice the gaps. Do yeah, path. absolutely. Absolutely. Well, welcome to the panel. Thank you so much for joining us. And Mark, I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about your background and some of the gaps you've seen in care coordination in the past. Happy to do that. I think I obviously work as a physician, but I've also had the experience as a patient and also had family members as patients. And something I've witnessed uh, quite frequently um, is uh, with delivery of instructions to patients, there really often isn't the consideration that's needed of the condition of the patient. 
um, both a personal family member, was had just had surgery, um, was literally falling asleep, dropping her head after the surgery as the residual of the anesthesia. And um, this earnest, friendly, wonderful nurse was providing post-op instructions. And then at the end of it, it asked, oh, did you have any questions? And I was listening intently, and I, so I knew sort of what was happening uh, with my partner. And I said, no, we, we're good. I got everything. And then as I was wheeling her out, her comment as we got out, she said, what was that person talking to me about in there? I, and she totally was oblivious. And then my own personal experience, I had surgery. And um, I read in the post-op um, notes and so forth, I'd actually had a physical therapist who'd walked me upstairs and downstairs and said, he's ready to go. And I remember seeing this person in the room showing me some kind of stretching exercise. I had no memory whatsoever of walking up and down the stairs. And so I think there's a lot that happens to patients and when they're sick, they're not ready to receive this information. And the healthcare providers have to consider that and figure out, do we need to repeat this later when the person's awake more and the drugs have gotten out of their system or um, have ensured that there's a family caregiver who understands exactly what needs to happen. Uh, well, Mark, thank you so much for bringing both your personal and your pro professional uh, perspectives to this panel. We really appreciate you being here today. Nisha, I wonder if you could tell us, you know, a bit about your background and the gaps you've seen. Um, and you're in the UAE, so you bring an international perspective to this. Oh, you're on mute, Nisha. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. So, so I've been into clinical practice for many years and also on the administrative side, you know, so I would like to bring forward one of the major challenges uh, that is the exchange of patient information piece among all stakeholders. And this could include the patients themselves. And at times you've been seeing that patients seek out medical help uh, when they reach uh, to a vulnerable state. Uh, and this scenario we've commonly seen uh, in case of migrant workers or maybe for global travelers. And here patients may provide only limited information about their health status, or, or they may not have access to the details. So this has a potential to cause delays in treatment. And this may also call for repeat assessments, uh, diagnostic tests, again, leading to more stress and more financial burden. Then from the pro provider side, I would like to mention that, you know, we've been seeing that there have been a lot of concerns related to handoff communications, more often on medicine reconciliation, uh, lack of resources to coordinate, and also uh, about the follow-up care during transition. Wow, it sounds like it sounds like no matter what country we're in, we all seem to be having the same challenges, huh? Well, yes. welcome to the panel. Thank you so much for being here today. And then finally, Marty Moore. Thank you so much for joining us. And tell us tell us your background and 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 I know that you are very passionate about this topic, so. You know, Donna, I've been a chief nursing officer for uh, almost 25 years. And so I've been over health systems, magnet hospitals. And then as you shared, I was on the corporate side. And so it's always been a passion of mine, but now it is even more so because it's personal. Um, so, you know, way back in early 1990, I was doing barcode medication administration long before people were realizing that it could be done working with the Institute for Safe Medication Practice. And so it's been part of my leadership, but now, now it's personal. And, you know, my father fell in uh, the summer of 2020 um, and it articulated that he had incredible pain. He was scanned once, uh, said he was fine, said that it was just a dematous ligaments. Um, and there were seven points, seven touch times where he saw a provider, he was in the emergency department, he was hospitalized for severe neck pain and no one rescanned, even though it was asked. And at the end, because the neck was unstable, um, he ended up having to uh, have uh, pretty extensive surgery and it was the causation of his death. And so, you know, when you're uh, inside healthcare and you can't get people to listen, we've got problems. We've got problems. Absolutely. Well, um, you know, again, thank you all so much for being here today. And let's, let's go ahead and get started with our content then. And again, 
um, are, here are all of the, the members of our panel today. So, but let's go ahead and get started talking about um, the, the different support systems in the community. Um, and Donna, I believe the, these are your slides. Oh, no, I'm sorry, Nisha, my apologies. My apologies, Nisha. Yeah. So, okay. yes. yeah, so, uh, so let's, talk, let's start getting talk about, talking about the support systems that are available in the community. Thank you, Donna. Yes, I, I would love to talk on this. So, so community care coordination systems, you know, they are gaining uh, momentum for promoting prevention and improving health outcomes across. Uh, they've been instrumental in connecting individuals to a comprehensive air, um, array of health promotion services. And we see that their coordination methods, they may vary on the objective they wish to support. Uh, some may begin with a population in mind, such as chronic disease management or supporting uh, developmentally challenged people. Uh, others may begin with some priority in mind, such as homelessness or food insecurity. And yet others we find they may uh, you know, start with some geography in mind. So we have health, so healthcare organizations, uh, you know, they should come forward and actually collectively agree on the roles of care coordination for each of these sectors. And the partnership should be promoted with examples of how each provider can benefit from the association. So they can envision themselves um, utilizing the resources available across the community uh, to the advantage of their patient care. We see that many community resources have been supporting logistical coordination. They've been supporting advocacy, uh, identification of personal goals and motivators, as well as education. As healthcare workers, uh, we can encourage as well as coordinate the participation of patients in these activities and also make them aware of the available resources. Then it's also fascinating to see how technology is beginning to transform care coordination. And it's helping us, uh, helping uh, you know, individuals uh, through common caregiving challenges. Uh, we see uh, nowadays a lot of systems and apps providing information on health and community resources. They can help address uh, different barriers of engagement, ensure the establishment of sustainable ongoing care plan for the patients. They can also support patient self-management. And one can also coordinate transportation, make appointments and reminders when needed using these resources. So you can move to the next slide, please. Yeah, so, so as, as we see, uh, you know, the new technology which is available, you know, uh, it's providing us with a lot of uh, information which is there and people should be taking advantage of it. It's, it's available across now and, and uh, we can explore all these apps and systems which are available. Next slide, please. So the, um, the WHO framework proposes five interdependent strategies you know, um, that need to be adopted to, uh, for better responding to people's needs throughout their life course. Now, each of this technique is meant to have an impact on a variety of levels. Now, from how services are offered to individual families and communities to how organizations, care systems and policy making, uh, making operates. But then the key of success of this framework will depend on um, various factors. For example, like, you know, it, it much largely depends on leadership support, uh, the governance structure we have, the staffing levels we would have, um, the network and community resources and the partners which are around and the screening tools that we are using, uh, patient communication, and uh, do we have a closed loop referral mechanism, the interoperability of the systems that we have, uh, also, a lot depends on quality improvement initiatives being taken up, and also important is the funding uh, to support. So, though the and though establishing uh, you know the sustainable system uh, based on this framework, it requires a lot of effort from my from both you know the healthcare providers and the community at large. Um, but overall, if we see the benefits are enormous. For example, um, you know, uh, yes, next next slide, please. For example, it can offer a better coordination of care that fills gaps in the services. It can promote effective communication among providers, um, social service agencies, and it can increase effective utilization of resources. It also promotes quality of care, builds community awareness and perception. 
It can also support growing your patient loyalty as well as the volumes. And community care coordination can also support reducing duplication of services, which is also a major challenge. It can help improve reimbursement and position the hospital for population health for the future. Thank you. Thank you so much, Misha. Um, you know, again, it's so interesting how the, you know, we, we all have the same challenges, no matter where we seem to be in the globe. And Marty, I know that um, you understand what Misha was talking about from a healthcare systems perspective, but, you know, what, what are some of the, 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 you know, patient needs that you're seeing in healthcare systems and how can we restructure them so that we can help patients better? Yeah, you know, it, it's, it's fascinating because uh, as I was preparing for today's webinar, I went out and I Googled uh, coordination of care. And I looked at all the images that came up and every single one, every single one had the hospital as the largest image. It, some of them had the hospital in the middle. And if you think about it, in, in the lifespan of, of an individual, the time that I've been hospitalized is just a blip. It's just seconds within my life. And so we have to kind of reframe. And so many times we're doing things that are trying to kind of create these bridges. And I call them uh, stereo strips. And people have said, well, they're band-aids. You know, they're really and truthfully kind of band-aids. Except if you think about what is the role of a bandage, it is to heal. And in truth, what we're trying to do by putting in coordinators and navigators is we're trying to bring disparate areas together. And that's why I call them stereo strips. But the issue with stereo strips is, is they ravel up. And that's what we're also finding. So many hospitals have, have put in systems and or roles and or programs to try to think about how they bridge in and how they bridge out. But in true fashion of a stereo strip, as it starts to roll up, that's when the system starts to fall apart. Let me give you an example. Many times we will discharge coming out of the hospital. And by the way, discharge means that I am done with you. Um, if you look at the, or the definition, it says, I'm done, I'm discharging, I have nothing more to do. And that's actually one of the fallacies that we have. But if you look at discharge and you look at then the fact that somebody is uh, being referred into home care, what the system doesn't do is to say, and what's happening there. We just do this kind of here you go kind of a moment. What we don't know is, is, is there a coordinated plan of care? Are they even gonna be able to get there within 24 hours? Most cannot. And then if you think about it and you go upstream and you start to look at what are these points of intersection that we have designed into our systems, such as primary care. Primary care hands over to a hospitalist and there's this discount. Now, the stereo strip that we're putting into that is the EMR, the electronic medical record. We're counting on people looking and understanding. Guess what? They don't. So if you think about and look at from a system standpoint, health really is, is not about the hospital and yet our biases bring it in that it is about the hospital. It is about really and truthfully everything that Nisha did a beautiful job of bringing forward. And that's the challenge that we have because as system leaders, as a, as a healthcare leader, I will tell you that I lived in the big box and I thought about care coordination from the big box outward. And I think that's a challenge for us. And I put in stereo strips. Wow, that is so well said. I love that thought because I, when I was a hospital administrator, I had the same thing. I thought, you know, the box was at the center, you know. And so, so Donna, I know, you know, over there in the UK, you've been, you've been. Oh, I'm sorry. Actually, before we get to that, do you have any any suggestions, Marty, about how we can restructure the systems? Yeah, I think I think we need a revolution, um, you know, and. And I think a little later in the webinar, I'm going to talk about maybe doing some design thinking and kind of bringing it out. But the first thing I would encourage people to do is to ask themselves fundamentally, what do they believe about health and well-being? 
Um, because as a leader, it wasn't until I had to reframe kind of my thinking, and then I needed to influence and engage others around, wait a minute here, we, we are a moment. What is our role? What is our scope as a hospital, as a health system? Do we hold people's health and that we are the, the uh, bearers of it? Or is it truly their individual health and we're partners? Mm -hmm. And when you start to uncover that, you really do pull back a lot of layers that I think is very beneficial to have conversations about and to make sure that you've got that alignment in your strategic plans and additionally within your executive leadership and all the way through. Good point, good point. So, so Donna, I know the UK has been trying this. They've been really working hard to, to improve care coordination across that entire continuum. So, um, you know what? What has happened? What's been happening over there in the in at the NHS? Oh right, okay. Um, as with every country in the world, the UK is wanting to improve the quality of service within patient care. If care coordination is not conducted with precision and u u unity, mistakes can be made that have devastating consequences for the patients. The latest framework to emerge only last month in the UK was in connection with patient safety, and it's called the Framework for Involving Patients in Patient Safety. This came about from a review from an advisory group chaired by Don Berwick in 2013, after a spate of serious incidents in one hospital. The result was this, as we can see, a promise to learn, a commitment to act. It's called Improving the Safety of Patients in England. In this review, this is what I'll be talking about. So what's the connection between this and our topic? Um, it's refreshing for me to sit, read this um, and that it's been recognized. What you have in the NHS is a unified system of care that is completely capable of identifying its problems, admitting them and acting to correct them. And yet even with a robust unified system, there are still gaps within that system. The two most important times when care coordination are at their most critical, where problems could occur, are during the admission and discharge processes. Both involve movement and information sharing. Both stages have the influence of claiming success or producing difficulties. One thing that's abundantly clear, healthcare professionals do not set out wanting to fail. In fact, completely the opposite. When things do not go according to plan, it is normally down to a chain of events and not just one factor alone. So let's have a look at some of the reviews recommended for identifying the problems. Next slide, please. The first one, incorrect priorities do damage. Other goals are important, but the central focus must always be on patients. And this is very true. We have all experienced when other factors have made circumstances difficult for staff as well as patients. When responsibilities are diffused, it's not clearly owned. With too many in charge, no one is. How often is work delegated? Sharing the workload is good, but if it's shared without the responsibility, we generally say, once you've handed something over, then it's their responsibility. But is it? And fear is toxic to both safety and improvement. How many times are we confronted with frontline staff that blame that if things do not go according to plan? And then again, when they are reluctant to act. For as a, as a family member, it can be difficult to witness when you know that they are a very small cog in a very big wheel. Next slide, please. So if we look at a brief overview of some of the changes necessary that we've addressed in the UK for these problems, Recognise with clarity and courage the need for wide systemic change. Systemic change also needs conviction, determination, and the backing of people using the system, which is all of us. Healthcare professionals are not alone on wanting change. For the benefit of everyone, everyone needs to be involved. Reassert the primacy of working with patients and carers to achieve healthcare goals. So this is regarding the state, the importance of working together. 
collaboration is achievable for reducing and removing the gaps within the healthcare goals when both parties are working towards the same goals and recognise that transparency is essential and expect and insist upon it. To demonstrate transparency, it requires two other factors that have a strong association and that is openness and honesty. If all healthcare professionals demonstrate this, it should not only assist in improving, improving the standards of care, but strengthen the working relationship with patients. And lastly, engage, empower, and hear patients and carers throughout the entire system and at all times. For me, this is a powerful statement. How difficult would this be to incorporate empowerment with hearing patients and caregivers within your working day? or even using the same strategy with your peers. Next slide, please. One recommendation, one recommendation that should happen from this, um, a promise to learn, a commitment to act says, patients should, when they wish, advise leaders and managers by offering their expert advice on how things are going, ways to improve on, and how the system works best to meet the needs of the patients. The standard of healthcare has never been better than it is today. However, there is still room for improvement. The complete inclusion of patients in their care decisions is still in its infancy, with many people embracing the joint decisions to be made, whilst others appear sceptical and resistant to change. This would not be undermining the medical profession, but providing a long awaited balance that is especially vital in all aspects of care coordination. Thank you. Thank you, Donna. Thank you so much. And, you know, it sounds like you guys are doing some great work over there in the UK, but, you know, again, everybody in the, in the world is trying to, to improve on this. So, so Mark, I wonder if you could, you know, Help people to understand how, how uh, organizations, how are they able to act to meaningfully measure how they're doing and, and why is it that more organizations don't measure this as, as well as some? Yeah, well, I think um, a key factor driving a lot of the work around care transitions was the Affordable Care Act and its inclusion of something called the Hospital Readmission Reduction Program, HRRP. And um, there was an article uh, published with some colleagues, um, Eric Coleman, um, who I think everyone knows is a leader in care transitions nationally, and was a MacArthur Genius uh, Grant awardee. Um, he focused on this aspect of the hospital is a tiny, tiny part of people's medical care and health throughout their lives. It's at what happens in their homes and in the community. But this is what was um, promoted as a way to try and improve care transitions. And we found in our study that it was about almost 20% of Medicare beneficiaries um, were rehospitalized. When these um, threats of penalties started coming out, you can see there's a pretty significant decline in hospital readmission rates um, for Medicare beneficiaries in the US, but they've been staying pretty stable. And um, currently about 50% of hospitals are receiving penalties related to the hospital readmission reduction program. And there's clear recognition now that one of the reasons or a major reason for hospital readmissions is not just the patient's medical condition, it's their home setting, their social determinants of health. Do they have electricity um, to cool things off in the summer? Um, you know, gas or electricity to warm things up in the summer? Do they have food? Do they have transportation? Um, do they feel safe in their homes? Do they have community support? These are the key factors that are driving a lot of it. Um, if you go to the next slide, another key measurement being used in the US is the hospital consumer assessment of healthcare providers and systems. So every um, patient or a large sample of patients when they're discharged from the hospital are surveyed CMS collects this data, and again, based on the results, they will penalize hospitals um, uh, for low scores compared to the rest of the US. And I think it measures some important things. It asks the patients and or their family caregivers if they're filling out the survey, which actually happens quite a bit, were the nurses and physicians treating you with courtesy and respect? Were they listening carefully to you? Did they explain things to you in a way you could understand? These are all individual questions. 
And then from the hospital perspective, these patients and their family caregivers are asked, did the hospital take my preferences and those of my family or caregiver into account? And did they, you have a good understanding of the things that you as a patient were responsible for in managing my health? So this is, these are things that are um, happening right now. Um, one of the things that um, a collaborative team um, that literally involved people from across the US, from California, to Louisiana, to Kentucky, to Boston, to Philadelphia, um, was something called Project Achieve. On the next slide, this was funded by the Patient Centered Outcome the Research Institute. Um, Achieves is a little clunky, um, but we came up with this acronym, Achieving Patient Centered Care and Optimized Health and Care Transitions by Evaluating the Value of Evidence. What we attempted to do was literally study patients and their family caregivers as they went through um, the hospital discharge process. And we ended up surveying almost 8,000 um, patients and approximately 3,000 family caregivers. Um, the next slide, it shows you some of our results. And another key aspect of this is we started off by um, conducting focus groups. It was the largest set of focus groups ever done um, with patients and their family caregivers related to the hospital discharge um, process. And the patients, and their family caregivers, this is what they told us. They look for certain services and provider behaviors that um, it really achieve what matters most to the patients and the family caregivers. They want the providers to communicate using empathetic language and gestures. In other words, sit down when you talk with the patients. Don't stand up at the door with your um, hand on the door handle. Um, they say, you know, this is a new experience for me being hospitalized, or I've only been hospitalized maybe a few times, and I don't know what's going to happen when I leave. Um, you've been taking care of thousands of patients with these issues. You should know what's going to happen. Make sure I, you anticipate what are going to be my needs and help me um, as I transition to home. They want to be involved in the discharge planning. They don't want to be told this is what you need to do. And then if you're going to provide information, Honestly, they, patients and their family caregivers, they don't really care about the pathophysiology of disease. They want to know what is the actionable information they need to take care of themselves. And then, as was mentioned very clearly um, by Donner, is that they want continuity. They want minimal handoffs, or that if there's a handoff, they want to feel that the handoff has actually occurred and they know there's going to be accountability um, from both the person who handed off and the recipient of that handoff. Um, next slide. So these are the things that they said mattered most for a successful transition of care. They want to feel cared for and cared about by providers. That needs to be, I think, measured a little bit more explicitly. Um, they want to see that there's unambiguous accountability from the healthcare system. Not that they got sick, they called um, their primary care provider, there was a voice message, call 911 if you're feeling bad. So they do, they get transferred in, they see somebody they don't know in the emergency department. They then get admitted to the hospital to somebody they don't know. And a lot of times the primary care provider doesn't know what's happened. Um, maybe there is a scary strip of the EHR, but we found in previous places I've worked that you needed to have that phone call, that accountability to make sure that the hospital providers, whether it's emergency medicine or hospitals, talk to the primary care provider. And I think they need to be involved actually in the discharge process without question. They, the family caregivers and patients want to feel prepared, confident, and capable of implementing these care um, plans. And what, one of the things we've, that has now come out of our research that we have submitted for publication is the importance of trust. If the patients and the family caregivers trust the health system, they actually are less likely um, to be rehospitalized from what we could see. So I think this is how we need to figure out how we measure trust among patients. And if it's not there, something needs to be done to establish that trust. Next slide. And I think that's um, it. Yeah. Thanks. Well, that's great, Mark. Great, wonderful solutions. Um, and we've got, you know, several questions about some of this in the in the Q&A. So please keep the questions coming. Um, we'll have about 15 minutes at the end to answer some of those. 
But in the meantime, you know, Marty, Mar Mark's brought up some really great ideas about how we can make those, you know, we can create those solutions and, and systems. But, you know, what's the mental shift that has to happen in order for that change to take place? You know, the mental shift is hard. Uh, that's the bottom line. It, you know, if your life's work has been in healthcare and you know how to run uh, health systems and hospitals or home care, it's really hard to reframe. But I want to kind of give a model to you. And, you know, uh, Mark did a beautiful job. And one of the things that he talked about is, is what's trust. And I define trust as an outcome based on actions. And so when you start to think about, okay, what is trust? Trust is an outcome. Well, if there's low trust, then what are the actions? And you start to ask those kinds of questions, it then really kind of uncovers. And, you know, the model that I use to help me reframe and to think differently is I, I, I personally had the opportunity to be trained in human-centered design thinking. Uh, we're going to be sending out information around that. I would tell you, put it into your repertoire of how you approach uh, problems because it opens your eyes to really very different kinds of solutions. But the questions that you've got to ask yourself is, do you believe in the three S's? And as you're doing design thinking, if you design the system to fit into its current system, you're going to get continuously what we're getting. And so you've got to back out and you say, do I fundamentally believe in the three S's? And S1 is self-management of health and well-being. Do I believe that individuals, those that I serve, those that I walk alongside in my communities, are the ones who should self-manage their health and well-being? Or do I see it as part of my job and accountability once they land in whatever place they land in. The second ask is advocacy of self and others. So when we look at that second S, one of the things that we have to think about is, is are we willing for people to be advocates? That takes active listening. And as Mark said, empathetic um, um, capabilities and empathetic presence. And then the third is, are we willing to blow up our systems to where we can allow and have self-navigation? Now, what does that mean? And that's when it gets fun because that's when you involve individuals outside of healthcare who think wild. They are wicked, wicked, wild thinkers. And you encourage them to ask the questions, challenge, and to say, why can't we do this? And that's when we can fundamentally start kind of what I call this revolution of how is it that we can create health systems that are safe, that people feel comfortable navigating through. I like it. I like it. I want to be wicked. <laughs> I want us all to be wicked thinkers. Misha, any thoughts from your perspective about how we can do that? How can we all be these wicked thinkers and um, and, and improve that holistic patient care and improve that patient engagement across the continuum. Yeah, thank you, Donna. So uh, what I would talk would be, you know, uh, repeating most of the things what uh, Mark mentioned. Uh, I believe, you know, for holistic patient care and engagement, the most vital thing is the empathetic hospital culture that values patient care and engagement. And this can thrive only when employees feel empowered and valued. Physicians feel that their patients are getting great care and patients feel that their services and the quality they are receiving are extraordinary. Now, next slide, please. Now coming to the specifics, you know, I would like to mention one important component is to focus on patient provider communication during pre and post discharge interventions. Uh, these would include uh, risk assessments for adverse uh, events or readmissions, uh, medical, medication reconciliation, uh, patient engagement, uh, patient counseling, tagging of red flags, which is so essential, and making disease specific management strategies. It is also very important that we look into resources for addressing post discharge issues, you know, especially related to communication when it comes to outpatient services, including the rehabilitation. 
enabling skilled staff to aid appropriate follow-up is is also going to add a lot of value for care coordination and this is something very very important that organization should should look forward to that we do have skilled staff that post discharge we do take care of our patients for communication we should take care of reaching out to patients either through telephone calls or through home visit so that you know we ensure a safe transition and facilitation of a proper clinical follow up wherever it is applicable and at all levels i would say that it is very important to ensure that information is transparent and the organization that is providing care is accessible we need to be available for them, for our patients and we all would acknowledge that with this pandemic the digital technology has taken a lot of prominence as a means of enabling patient provider interactions across the continent we we see more and more uh, healthcare organizations embracing uh, the healthcare technology like telemedicine teleconsultations you know these lastly i would like to add that prioritizing quality outcomes and ongoing monitoring is also very very essential as mark mentioned uh, and the strategy should include measuring outcomes like the 30 day uh, readmission rate which was mentioned um, uh, you know measuring adverse drug events medication errors a uh, patient reported outcome measures where you understand you know uh, uh, what's the perception of your patient for the care that you're giving plus enhancing on electronic uh, health records and telehealth communications as i already mentioned thank you thank you so much um and and so donner i wonder you know you you've been dealing with this for for many many years and you know been very involved in the in the care of your son what are some tips and some strategies that you can provide to others that you know can help patients and families be more involved in their care transitions yes i have and you know it's been a, a, a huge learning curve and what we found is um i use the same strategies for for care transitions as with every aspect of my son's care and we mainly simplify um everything because everything else in his life is so complicated that it's most important that we find the most effective way of dealing with stuff and these are just four points which um you know it's it's going to going to be a very brief overview but this is what um we we use to design for maximum benefit great is the advantage of using strategies such as these is that they are easily adapted and they they meet um individuals needs you know and you can change them or add it it depends so the first one be honest and that means with the professionals too honesty can be a difficult one to achieve especially if identifying gaps in care coordination needs to be brought to staff or sometimes even the patient's attention but this should always be a two way street for communication um to be honest with you know both sides need to do this alleviate anxiety and fear these are possibly two of the most negative traits as human beings we possess overthinking can occur to the most level headed of us when we find ourselves in vulnerable situations beyond our control that renders us unable to fully engage fear is generally created by the unknown it's left to build when it's left to build it then turns into anxiety and then we you know complications do set in but the more you deal with the fears and the anxieties and the triggers that cause them the less they appear and they do become reduced so both of these can be crippling to a person and yet they're both able to be managed um the next one insight use it oh sorry not the next slide sorry insight use it the one common factor between many patients and their carers is the experience and knowledge that they have accumulated from the medical conditions their experience the treatment that they've received by information sharing everyone benefits and then the last expect the unexpected or the human factor just in um doesn't matter how much planning or goal setting is prepared prior to any form of patient's transition life as a habit of throwing a curveball no one expects 
and this is the human element. And as we are all human, it affects all of us. In times such as this, I find that I just have to pause. I take a step back and breathe. I process the situation, and this is usually when I find myself <laughs> to say, expect the unexpected. As a patient could deal with these type of situations every day, or even several times a day. Next slide, please. And finally, I would like to leave you with this statement from the World Health Organization. This demonstrates that the clinical and patient aspect of care are two halves of which we are all responsible for bringing together. The term transition of care is broader than clinical handover because it encompasses the clinical aspects of care transfer and other factors such as views, experiences and needs of the patient. By embracing patient involvement at every point of the clinical process, this will be one less factor being the cause of breakdowns in care coordinations. And I'd like to thank you. And that's well, it. Thank you, Donna. I really appreciate you being with us today and all of our panelists. It's time for us now to, to get to some questions. Before we do that, I just wanna uh, wrap up just a few more housekeeping items, just to remind everybody, if you were here in the beginning, you saw this. Um, if you are interested in receiving CNE or CME, CNE or ACPE credit for this, then it'll come through MedStar Health. Um, and again, respiratory therapists may also qualify uh, for nursing credit for this. You'll receive an email from MedStar if you registered as one of these professionals indicating that you would like to seek this CE. And um, if you would, if you are any of these folks, uh, you know, if you're seeking ACHE, CPPS, BCPA, or CPHQ credit, then um, if you indicated that, then you'll either receive a certificate from us or you can log it into your system um, for ACHE or NAHQ will take care of it for CPHQ. Um, here at the Patient Safety Movement, you know, we are so very, very excited to be able to offer these webinars on a monthly basis for free. Um, and, but we could certainly use your support. Um, so we are a nonprofit organization. So if you would like for, to, to, to help us to continue to be able to provide this education free of charge to everybody, then please visit our website at patientsafetymovement.org slash donate. We would really appreciate any support that you can provide. So thank you everybody, but we're gonna move ahead on to our Q and A session. Um, and there are lots and lots of questions going on here in the chat. I think, um, you know, one of the big questions that I'm seeing here is related to, um, you know, how do we, well, first of all, here's, here's a great question. And maybe Misha, you can start is, is there anybody that's doing this right? Is there any healthcare system in the world that has successfully um, figured out how to manage care appropriately across the continuum? Uh, Nisha or anybody? If you know the answer, please tell me. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I, I don't think there's any, any organization across the world which is the perfect. There are learnings from, from each one of them, you know. Yeah, yeah. Well, and I think what we've all learned is, you know, there is no healthcare system that is going to fix this without involving patients and families. But there's a lot of questions in the chat talking about how do we adequately prepare patients and families who don't know how to do this? Uh, Mark, I saw that you answered several questions in the chat. You want to expand on some of those thoughts? Um, you know, I think... Uh... A key aspect of all of this is that keeps getting repeated over and over again is that one, we've got to involve the patients and their family caregivers. Um, uh, you know, I, I grew up working in a family gas station and I remember hearing Don Berwick comment <clears throat> that basically hospitals are big repair shops. And so look at what's happened now with cars that they don't go in the repair shop nearly as much. And as we are about to make this transition to electric cars, I don't know if anybody's seen this, there was a company in Southern California that bought a whole bunch of electric cars and they thought it would be a novelty. But one of the things that they found it out is that these cars were still running 500,000 miles later and really just needed their windshield wipers and tires replaced. And so, I, you know, I envision a time where we begin to design our system 
so that people get good education and good food as they're growing up and they're, they, they, they're taught how to take care of themselves instead of this, let's wait for them to get sick. And I remember when we published our original health literacy paper way back in 1995, there was this incredible editorial um, by a PhD educator. And what he basically said was that, um, you know, trying to deal with this um, when patients are 65, 70, 75, may be too late. And we need to invest in making sure patients know how to read. And I completely agreed with them. And I would agree more as, as I've gone through my career. Unfortunately, we just can't uh, negate the idea that we still need to address these other individuals who are now, they are 75, they're sitting in front of us. But we've got to begin to undertake, if you will, some preventive care. And you know, there was the original slide that talked about the different steps. And it was mentioned the hospitals in the middle of a lot of these graphs. Well, that diagnosis and treatment steps, those are gargantuan from a financial perspective. And they would shrink if we invested more in the education and prevention components. And, and there's no doubt about that. But this has been, I think, one of the difficulties we talked about um, you know, all this new technology that's coming out in medications that cost you know, $100,000 a year and so forth. Well, Donna, I was gonna also share that um, in, in, at least here in the US and, and uh, our payer system is many times now jumping over hospitals. So many of our insurance companies have said, listen, we've got to figure out how uh, to help our covered lives, our individuals that we care for, um, to where they self-navigate and they can make the right choices and they're advocates for themselves. So remember the three S I talked about, we're seeing that in the payers. Now, what's fascinating is, is many times health systems are not part of those conversations, nor are they part of that plan. And so they're really kind of still over here. And I would encourage you, and I saw a, one person say, hey, I think I think health premiums, uh, you know, many times are kind of influencers of that. I would sit down with your, your top three payers and let's do a pilot and let's talk about, let's be wicked and ask those questions about how can we can design it. I can tell you one payer is sending food to uh, identified um, covered lives. They have uh, exercise programs that they're bringing in via the women of Winnebago. I mean, there's just so many things that, that they're doing to really create this uh, health and well-being, this self-navigation. Partner up. I, I would encourage people to partner up. I would agree. I, I, I would absolutely agree. Um, you know, Donna, there was a question in, in the chat about um, about whether or not we could use virtual reality to train patients. I wonder if you could give us your perspective on that. And you know, how, what, what are some of these technologies that we can use to better train patients to participate? Well, that is a very good, um, very good question. I mean, with technology and the way it's going, um, we do have in the UK, um, videos and films that use like a virtual tour around the hospital and what they're actually you know will come up against you know from entering into the hospital and they work through the process so yes that could be something that that could be looked into but yes it's very interesting because it's not just the health um care professionals that need information it's it's the patients and yes and family members because a lot of people come in and they don't know what to expect you know they they see there's so many different people so many different um mm -hmm. grades or uniforms and anything and you know it's very confusing it's very daunting um so yes i think we do have a, a lot of um scope there but it's just actually finding something that is is going to be suitable for the, the wider audience, the, the you know the, the the higher bigger patient thing. Yeah, so yeah, oh, that's going to be interesting to see where we go from there. Yeah, well, I think it's you know it's really interesting, Donna, because you you know you you bring up that different perspective of the patient, and I think there's yes. also some some thoughts in here in the chat about 
um, how healthcare professionals, healthcare clinicians are dealing with patients that may be quite, you know, or patients' family members who may be a little bit aggressive, probably because they are very afraid and they're very overwhelmed. Yes. But, um, you know, yes. Mark, I, I wonder, Mark, do you have any thoughts about, you know, how do healthcare clinicians who are very overwhelmed in this very complex care setting, trying to do everything they can, how can they better deal with these families that are overwhelmed and maybe perceived to be overly aggressive? Yeah, no, no. I saw this pop up a lot of times. This has been um, a, frankly, troubling um, issue that's coming up more and more. In a way, it, it can be almost even equated to what we're seeing happen on airplane flights, um, where passengers um, uh, basically uh, lose their sanity. And I think there's there's a lot more distress in the world with everything that's going on, certainly with COVID-19. Um, and, you know, when I see family acting out, it just tells me that there's a huge amount of stress that they're experiencing. And um, there hasn't been the resources to begin to address um, those issues. Um, uh, I, you know, again, I, I think you know, we, there's a difference between somebody being acutely ill, needing true emergency and critical care and trying to address that versus somebody with a chronic illness um, that may have a little bit of difficulty and but there's really no other place but the repair shop of the hospital. And I think if we're able to maybe get this care delivery out of the hospitals and into people's homes, um, even especially before they're sick, that would be a truly transformative change. I mean, the information on hospital at home, it's staggering. And the thing is, is uh, you know, people, um, I mean, Bruce Leff at Johns Hopkins, I mean, he showed this 15 plus 20 years ago. I mean, there was a systematic review 10 years ago that was published showing its effectiveness. Shorter length of stays, even though the patient's at home, they, they literally need hospital care for a shorter length of stay. Um, reduced readmissions, huge increases in satisfaction. And so the key factor in a lot of this is that I've you know, been realizing for quite a while, actually, the funds flow has got to go towards better care for the patient that is more you know, encompassing of the community and not rewarding more surgeries, more procedures, really super expensive pharmaceuticals and so forth. But it's gonna to have to be balanced. I mean, there are some expensive procedures um, that have astonishing you know, life-saving outcomes. And we now know that. The issue is we're gonna to have to have, and I think Donner had this, we've gotta to begin to be honest. There's a cost when we decide to pay $100,000 for a medication um, that has marginal, if any, benefit to patients, or maybe it benefits one patient and to a thousand that you give it to. Um, and we're then depriving thousands of people of something that we know works. Yeah, that's very, very true. You know, and I think I think we also have to recognize somebody had, had asked a question about lean and when a hospital implements lean and everybody you know, is now pulled in so many different directions and so much to do. And, you know, I think that that's a fairly interesting question because yes, our, our clinicians are overwhelmed, our patients are overwhelmed, our administrators are overwhelmed, everybody is overwhelmed. That's not the definition of lean, right? Like, like lean isn't supposed to lead to everybody is too overwhelmed and too busy to do what they need to do. So, you know, any thoughts there about how we can improve that? Well, or Marty? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I mean, I would jump in and say, um, you know, the lean, the principles of lean are good, but but they lay on the foundation of of you know a system that is fundamentally strong, and so you've got to step back and say, wait a second here, you know, as we're looking at the principles of lean, and we're utilizing it in whatever system we're looking at this conversation we're talking about care transitions we we have a fundamental system that is strong that we then can move efficiencies out and then we can bring it in 
if it's not strong, then you're going to do stereoscripts. I mean, that's what you end up doing. And that's what I've watched with. And, you know, I've done Kaizen events, believe me, I've done tons of them. And, and we just take a little bit and we bring this and we bring this and we put a stereo strip on. But we didn't step back to ask the question of fundamentally, is the system strong or what is it that we need to fix here? Yeah. And then go forward from there. Well said. Well, we are right at the, uh, at the hour now at 830 here on the Pacific Coast. So, um, you know, we didn't get to all of the questions in the chat and in the Q&A, but as always, we will download that, that, that content. We will uh, confer with our, our wonderful panelists here today, and we will make sure that we post those along with this video, the PowerPoint. And I believe there was a question, Mark, you brought up um, a, a, an idea by Eric Coleman. Um, to, and we can make sure that we post any references that anybody made to here um, on, on our YouTube page. So, so thank you to all of our panelists. Um, Donner, Nisha, Marty, and Mark, it was a pleasure to have you here today. Thank you. And thank Thanks you. Wonderful. Thank Everybody you. have a wonderful day and we'll see you next time.